Well hello everyone and you join us here today to do a little bit of learning. Learning about watches is fun and we're going to have some fun. Tom, would you say that you know things about watches? Well, I'm a humble guy, so I would probably say, I know one or two things, <laughs> but I'm not an expert. Do you think you would know 10 things? Uh, I would know 10 very basic things about watches. These are the hands. That's the <laughs> crown. This is the bezel. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't try and get yourself some extra points by splitting each hand into a separate thing. Oh, well, now, yeah, that's a thorny issue because I do struggle with that bit. Well, I have 10 facts today that I'm going to tell you, Tom. Except I thought, why should I tell you 10 facts? I'm going to tell you 10 things and you have got to tell me whether or not they are fact or fiction. Do you think you're up for the challenge? Sure, why not? Let's do it. Dear viewer and listener, I also want you to play along. Say in the comments whether or not you think each thing is true or false. Are you ready? Let's do it. Then we'll begin. Tom, my first fact, air quotes, may be pending, is this. Rolex, the brand that we all know and love, founded by Hans Wilsdorf, was founded right here in sunny England. What do you think of that? Yes, I'm going to say that's true. Although I don't know how punishing you're going to be with the details here. Did he did he start it in his native Germany and then he moved it over to England? Or did, no, he was quite he was an Anglophile, wasn't he? So I think yeah, he came over here to start a watch company. I think he loved Covent Gardens and he there was something swanky about that he liked, so he started it there. Does that sound about right? That is that is about right. Yeah, he was an Woo Anglophile. Uh, he was a he was a language specialist as well. Was very well versed in the marketing side and the supply side of Swiss watches. So he came to England to start a business with his brother-in-law, founded it in the UK, called it Rolex. He moved to Switzerland and registered the brand in Switzerland because of um, the war. World right. War. And that meant that he had difficulties with import taxes and things. So he just thought, there, I'm going, I'm going back to Switzerland. And um, yeah, their Rolex has stayed ever since. Cool. Fact potentially number two. Swiss watchmaking only exists because the Swiss band dancing. <laughs> I thought you were going to leave it there at Swiss watchmaking only exists, and I was going to say true. <laughs> there is no other watchmaking. Swiss watchmaking only exists because the Swiss band dancing. Mm -hmm. Hmm. That's interesting. The origins of Swiss watchmaking in my, in my mind is lots of cold isolated people taking it up as a hobby in their mountain huts. Um, but I don't think they were put there because they couldn't dance anymore. That's a bit Billy Elliot. <laughs> I'm going to say no. I don't, I don't know what could have happened. I don't know the chain of events that could have occurred for that to be true. So I'm going to say no. Well, in 1541, Protestant reformist John Calvin decided that pleasure was a sin. Yeah. And that anything that was done for the benefit of your enjoyment, should be banned. He sounds like a grumpus. I like him. <laughs> he was played by Clint Eastwood in the film. <laughs> Is that true? No. Is this a bonus untrue fact? <laughs> <laughs> um, but John Calvin uh, banned jewellery as well. And so all the people who made jewellery had to find something else to do to make some money. So they turned their hand to watchmaking instead. And so began the lore of Swiss watchmaking. Right, okay. So it wasn't that they were dancing and they couldn't do dancing anymore. It's that this guy banned all manner of fun. Yep. And so they were like, watchmaking's not fun, we'll do that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. That makes sense. Number three, Tom. Omega's first waterproof watch was a watch inside a watch. What, like a Kinder Egg? Yeah. They thought... We want to make a waterproof watch, but our watch isn't waterproof. Let's build a waterproof watch and build it around our watch. So then our watch is waterproof. That sounds weird. I don't like that. I don't like that one bit. Um, <laughs> Are you going to commit to not liking it? I can't remember what Omega's first waterproof watch looked like, but I'm pretty sure I've been through their history about us pages on their website enough times 
<laughs> to remember seeing a watch inside a watch. I'm going to say no. <laughs> well, in 1932, Omega invented the Marine. And in order to make the Marine waterproof, they built a watch case to go around the watch case. I'm not entirely sure why they didn't just make the watch waterproof itself, but they literally took a watch case and built it around another watch case to make the watch waterproof. Right, okay, that's weird. That sounds like um, just put loads of duct tape around it kind of solution to their problem, doesn't it? <laughs> it really does. It really does. No one, maybe the person who invented it, had a really high status in the company and no one dared question them. Interesting. Next one, Tom. The chronograph watch originally had one pusher for start, stop and reset. Yep. And Breitling was like, why don't we have another one for reset so you can start and stop it and start it again? And no one had thought of that before. True or false? Bright, so you're saying Breitling invented reset? Separate reset. I'm going to guess and say yes, they did. Because Breitling's a well-respected brand. They've got to have some secret chops that I don't know about it. And I think that's probably one of them. You're correct. Awesome. Breitling did invent the second pusher. They also invented the first pusher as well. Uh, the chronograph on a, in a pocket watch, the pusher was part of the crown. And Breitling thought, well, that's a bit annoying. Let's separate that out and put it on the case just above the crown. And then later on, they, they thought, well, why don't we just put the reset separately? And, uh, and that's the format that we have today, invented by Breitling. Cool. I do like the mono pusher system, though. It's less confusing. <laughs> You don't get lost when there's only one. <laughs> Fussy Breitling making it overcomplicated. Keep it simple, Switzerland. Yeah. Enough of that. On to the next one. Watch dials used to be painted with deadly, deadly radium. Oh, yeah. Unless you're going to get pedantic and say, well, no, not the dials, but the markers. And I'm going to say, yes, that's true. I remember seeing a uh, Watchfinder video about such a thing. <laughs> it is true. Can you believe it that radium used to be used for all sorts of weird and wacky things? People would paint themselves with it. They would eat it. They made butter and soap because it was just considered to be this wonder material. There was absolutely no reasoning behind that at all. But because it glowed, people thought it must have some sort of rejuvenating energy. Um, quite the opposite. It was very uh, deadly and, and killed people. And um, the, the people who would paint the glowing material onto dials would also, they'd lick their brushes to a point and even paint it on their nails and teeth because it glowed and it was fun. And they suffered from some pretty horrible necrosis and, um, and death as well. You ready for the next one, Tom? Let's do it. The first watches were made from perfume holders. What? What does that mean? What's a perfume holder? What, you mean a bottle? So back in the day, right, I'm talking the 1500s, people were quite stanky. <laughs> yeah. And so they would wear little holders around their neck on a chain with smelly stuff in them. Sure, sure. Uh, and to, to try and cover up their aroma. Because they had like a hundred layers on. <laughs> Powdered wigs up the wazoo. And the first watch was made out of one of those. I don't know whether you've been watching too many period dramas and you just thought that would be a funny thing to say. I'm going to say that's true. The first watch was made out of a little vial of smelly stuff from the Dark Ages. It is absolutely true. Wow. The pomander, this perfume holder that worn around the neck, it was a luxury item. It was made in gold and was very ornate. So the, the smelly wealthy people didn't smell like the smelly poor people. And the guy who invented the first watch, who compacted the clock into a portable form, a guy called Peter Henlein, he was in prison at the time. Or rather, he had, he had been exiled to a, a monastery. And so he used one of those to invent his clock because he couldn't make a case for himself. Right. Pretty weird. Just when you thought it couldn't get any weirder. Well, here's something for you. Oh God, here we go. Patek Philippe was a massive flop and tried to sell the company to JLC. Absolutely true. <laughs> it was absolutely true. In the 1930s, Patek Philippe that made pocket watches, no one was buying them anymore. And they were like, no, no one's buying our pocket watches. Won't someone buy our company? And Jezre Lecourt was like, hmm. And they were like, please, please buy our company. Because um, the Jezre Lecourt guys were on the board of Patek Philippe. And they were like, 
Nah. Yeah. And they now don't own one of the biggest and most famous watch companies in the world. Crazy, yeah. I mean, if Patek Philippe had, you know, said, one day the Nautilus will happen and slap the roof, they probably would have made a sale of their company. But <laughs> there you go. Regrets. All right, check this one out, Tom. The wristwatch was invented for women and not men. Oh, yeah, I know that, I think. Wristlets, that's what they used to call them, and they were for the dames. They certainly were, Tom. Do you know why they were only for the dames? Um, No, not especially. I suppose men had big pockets. Was it always the pockets thing? The, the, the ladies not having big enough pockets for anything goes all the way back. They had no room for pocket watches. That's exactly right. Is it? Wow. That is exactly right. So the story goes, right, King Charles II of England got sick of the fact that everyone was wearing French fashion because it was a bit of a thing. If you went to the courts of your fellow kings and you were wearing the fashion that they had ordained, it was a bit of a like, mm, yes, you're wearing our fashion, loser. And King Charles was sick of being a loser. So he he said, no, we're going to make our own fashion. And he invented the hoist coat upon which there were pockets. Right. And so the pominder, remember that from earlier, on the little chain found its way into the pocket. It was worn around the neck by men and women, found its way into the pocket for men. The women were like, but we don't got no pockets. Yeah. And so it ended up as a bracelet, which they did wear. Well, there you go. Indeed. History be crazy. Tom, true or falsified, Rolex copied the Submariner, including the name. Ooh, interesting. Who'd they copy it from? Seiko. <laughs> I think that's true. I think they copied... I, I think Seiko invented the Submariner, they called it the Submariner, they sent it down to the bottom of the Mariana Trench on the wrist of a wily young man and didn't tell anyone about it. Hans Wilsdorf got wind of it and went, oh, that looks good. I'll do that. You're kind of right, aside from the Seiko bit. <laughs> um, oh, well, we don't know. They may well have done that and no one will know to this day. Uh, yeah. But the, the Seiko... Cause say now, now, now I'm saying Seiko. <laughs> The Rolex Submariner look and functionality, the, the dial and the bezel, was copied from Blancpain. Right. And the name was copied by Brook and Son. Now, we don't know Brook and Son anymore, but they had invented a dive watch several decades earlier. They called it the Submarine and forgot to patent it. Ah. Oh. And copyright the name. And so Rolex went, mm-hmm, yes, please, and even took the name submarine added an r on the end made it submariner and there you have it wow there you go <laughs> i should have i should have guessed the the blanc pan yeah i knew that they were around in the early stages of dive watches so cool interesting last one tom you ready patek philippe known manufacturer of all things mechanical sure invented the world's first electronic clock oh okay um yeah they've got that very, very highly accurate, dare I say atomic? Maybe I'll admit atomic, but they're very big and they look like old 80s hi-fi stacks. And they were used, you know, people would set the time off those ones. <laughs> they were so accurate. <laughs> so I'm going to say, yeah, they were at the forefront of electronic clocks and say that they were the first. You're absolutely right. And those, those clocks that you're talking about were used by airports, broadcasting centres, observatories, train stations, to make sure they ran absolutely dead on. And the originator of those clocks was invented in 1956 by Patek Philippe, the first electronic clock. It was two feet wide and four feet tall, the first clock. It was a beast. Wow. Yeah, so that is, yeah, that's quite a lot like an old top-loading VHS player, isn't it? In the 80s. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Um, I Hang was, a minute. I wasn't keeping... Were they all true? <laughs> Indeed they were. Oh, damn it. If my pattern recognition <laughs> abilities had been better, we could have got through that a lot quicker. <laughs> 
Dear viewer and listener, how many of those did you get right? Did you figure out early on that they were all true? Let me know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching and listening. And um, please do like, comment, subscribe, all of that good stuff. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. Bye-bye.